All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to season two of the Interstellar Probe Study webinar series. My name is James Mistandria, and I'm the Assistant Project Manager for the Interstellar Probe Study and will be the host for today's webinar. Before we start today's presentation, I would like to outline the logistics of today's event. As a member of the audience, your audio and video are off. During the presentation, please submit your questions in the question and answer feature. You may also upvote questions. During the question and answer session, I will start with questions with the largest amount of upvotes and proceed down the list. And now I will set the stage for today's webinar and the future plans of the study. The Pragmatic Interstellar Probe Mission Concept Study is now entering its final year, and in the fall, the team will release a mission concept study for the Space and Solar Physics Decadal Survey. Today's presentation will be on the finalized science goals and example payloads for the Interstellar Probe Mission Concept, and will be presented by Pontus Brandt, the project scientist, and Elena Pavornikova, the heliophysics lead from the Interstellar Probe Study. These science goals and questions have been developed through a strong collaborative interaction with the community, and we thank all of you who have contributed to this process. As the study progresses through 2021, the APL-led engineering team will finalize the remaining engineering trades, and the final webinar of this season will be a presentation on the whole study by the study's principal investigator, Ralph McNutt, and the study's mission system engineer, Jim Kinnison. The idea of an interstellar probe has existed for decades, but through this pragmatic study, which includes community engagement and support from you, we are one step closer to the realization of this truly awe-inspiring mission, and today we continue on that journey together. And now, Pontus and Elena, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, James. Um, welcome to season two, episode one, everybody. So since the beginning of this study, that began now three and a half years ago or so, there's been one key ingredient that has really made this possible, as James alluded to. And that is um, all of you, of course. It's the team, it's the community, it, it's all of our drive to explore. And that's what counts and, and what will continue to count. So what we will present today is, is the result of this large community organized now across uh, eight working groups. We started out with 65 participants or so in the first workshop, uh, as you see here, it grew to 86. And then last year during the virtual workshop, I think we have over 250 registered participants. And today we're pushing towards 500 members uh, around the global on, on the email list here. So to start off this season, we thought we would change it up a little bit. So Elena, are you ready to kick off season two with me? You got to unmute. Absolutely, let's start. <laughs> All right, here we go. So, during its evolution, our sun with its protective magnetic bubble has completed nearly 20 revolutions around the galactic core. During this journey, it has plowed through widely different interstellar environments that have all shaped the system that we live in today. The orders of magnitude differences in, in the properties of, of this interstellar plasma and gas Plasma and gas are responsible for an extreme range of, of sizes and shapes of the global heliosphere through, through its history and through this journey. This in turn has had dramatic consequences for the penetration of this primordial soup of interstellar matter that have made all of us and have affected several crucial aspects of elemental and isotopic abundances, chemical atmospheric evolution, and maybe even conditions for habitability. So in a mere thousands of years from now, the, the sun will likely be entering a completely new and different interstellar environment and, and undergo another transition that will shape its continued evolution and fate. Hold on, Pontus. Is this really a mission to traverse and explore the different interstellar clouds uh, that the sun may head into in the next several thousand years? That sounds like a lot of science fiction. <laughs> well, uh, it, it is not science fiction. An interstellar probe, uh, as I'm showing here, it, it's a pragmatic mission concept uh, that would explore the boundaries of the heliosphere into the known interstellar cloud, into the unknown interstellar cloud, with a nominal design lifetime of, of 50 years, enabled by conventional chemical propulsion and a good old Jupiter gravity system to get to about uh, 400 AU, which is a little bit more than twice the distance of what Voyager will ever reach. Given that Voyager outlasted its design lifetime by a factor of 10, it, chances are very high that uh, this pragmatic interstellar probe uh, would last e even up to 2000 AU, as, as shown by the dashed line here. 
So in a sense, interstellar probe represents this sort of snapshot in time along this solar journey through the galaxy to understand the, the physics of the heliosphere, uh, the interstellar medium, all of that today, and also to ultimately inform us where this habitable bubble came from and, and where we are going in the galaxy. So yes, Pontus, I can actually see three science goals forming here. So let me be more specific. So Interstellar Probe is the heliophysics mission and its primary goal is to explore the unique interaction responsible for upholding the boundary of the heliosphere, which is also applicable to a vast range of other astrospheres in our galaxy. And this represents one of the outstanding problems in space physics today. Beyond the heliosphere, the unexplored local, interst local interstellar medium presents a completely new territory that is decisive for the global heliospheric interaction and holds the key for understanding our galactic home. On a trajectory leaving the solar system, there are other opportunities besides heliophysics as well. So for planetary science, this is the exploration of uh, small planets and Kuiper belt objects beyond Neptune. Flyby observations on Interstellar Pro will enable a huge step forward in understanding of these distant worlds. Infrared measurements along an outward trajectory would enable unique observations of the large scale dust disk encircling the solar system that would provide crucial ground truth for understanding plan planetary system formation in general. Astrophysics can benefit also from being outside the dust cloud of, in the solar system, allowing to see the extra galactic background light from early galaxies and early stars. Interstellar probe is a unique opportunity to study this early period of galaxy formation. So let me explain in more details the heliophysics science objectives for the mission and science questions that community helped us to finalize in this mission study. The first objective is to determine the physical processes that shape the global heliospheric interaction and, and their global manifestation. So the shape of the heliosphere, whether it's more like a comet-like shape or a bubble or a croissant or something else, it remains one of the hottest debates in the community. Ibex and Cassini energetic neutral atom observations have revealed what we know to date about the heliospheric shape. But the two missions from, from, from vantage point inside the heliosphere, and they suggest different shapes. So IBEX data suggests that the heliosphere has a long elongated tail, while Cassini Inca data suggests that heliosphere is more round, confined by the strong magnetic field uh, of the interstellar medium. So our best current models also do not agree about the shape. Um, and global imaging from a vantage point uh, and on outward trajectory will capture the first definitive picture of the heliosphere from outside. And in the middle of the slide, you see the simulation, how the heliosphere might look like as seen in energetic neutral atoms with energies around 70 keV from the distance 250 astronomical units from the sun. So also ENA observations on Ibex and Cassini in different energy ranges discovered bright features in the sky that we call Ibex ribbon and Cassini ENA belt. We still do not understand processes that create these global features. And going through these structures, Interstellar Pro will measure in situ particle distributions and fields with high cadence right at the source where this ENA is created to understand the mechanisms behind uh, ENA ribbon and belt. So now the two voyagers encountered completely new plasma regime in the helium sheath where the pressure is dominated by particles with energies larger than thermal, so-called peak affines with energies of a few keVs. Voyagers did not measure peak affines, leaving a gap in our understanding of this critical particle population and their role in upholding the vast, the, the vast heliosphere. Measurements on interstellar probe of particle distributions in thermal, superthermal, and into high energy range and fields will enable to determine energy partitioning and pressure across the termination shock, heliosheath, and heliopause. Wait a, wait a minute, Ellen. I, I got to interrupt you here. This sounds all very compelling, but so, so why is this really why is this really different from what what the Voyagers are are doing and have done? I mean, why is interstellar probe different? Well, I see your doubt, Pontus. So Voyager has made remarkable discoveries at the heliosphere edge, but there are many questions and mysteries left. 
Uh, being originally the planetary mission, Voyagers had a limited payload to explore this unique plasma regime at the heliosphere edge. Voyagers did not measure particle distributions, pick up ions, and had insufficient sensitivity for the magnetic field uh, in the helios sheet. Also, Voyagers did not measure electrons or interstellar neutral gas. Observations on interstellar probe will fill these critical gaps. And also, Voyagers uh, will lastly like, uh, last uh, until 170 astronomical units from the sun with gradual uh, switching off of instruments and will only provide glimpses of what is happening in the interstellar medium. So let me explain some uh, mysteries in more details. Next slide. So the termination shock crossing by Voyager 1 was indeed the first signature of the heliosphere edge. So that's the largest shock in the heliosphere and ex was expected to be the strongest. But observed changes in plasma fields and energetic particles at the shock transition were completely unexpected. The termination shock appeared to be a weak shock that heats plasma very little. Most of the solar wind energy is transferred to pick up ions or uh, other energetic particles. Revisiting the termination shock with in situ measurements uh, of ions uh, from super thermal, uh, from thermal uh, through super thermal up to 100 MeVs, uh, and, and also measurements of electrons in fields and waves with high cadence, is crucial to discover energy balance, uh, acceleration processes, turbulence, electrons behavior at the termination shock. So when anomalous cosmic rays were discovered by Voyagers, it was expected that termination shock, since it's the largest shock in the heliosphere, it's also an efficient uh, accelerator. So let me first explain. So anomalous cosmic rays are particles that start from interstellar neutrals, get ionized and get accelerated in the heliosphere up to tens of MeVs in energy. However, what we saw that termination shock did accelerate particles, but not to the high energies that has been absorbed in the Healy sheet. And anomalous cosmic rays intensities continue to roll up as voyagers traverse deeper in the Healy sheet. With measurements of particles distributions and fields, we will be able to distinguish between current hypotheses, how anomalous cosmic rays are accelerated, where this happens in the flanks of the helio sheath or by turbulence processes or reconnection or something else. So another mystery from Voyagers is that heliopause, which is the boundary of our bubble, is not the surface, but rather with complex interactions between heliospheric energetic particles and particles coming from the interstellar space. The open question is, what is the structure and very nature of the heliopause? Are there any instabilities playing a role? What kind of instabilities and how heliospheric particles escape into the galaxy? And another puzzle, we expected that after we cross the heliosphere boundary, we would observe a direction of the magnetic field in interstellar medium different from the heliosphere. However, the direction of the interstellar magnetic field outside the heliosphere appeared to be the same. This is complete mystery. And this oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, Elena. So uh, I got to interrupt you again. I buy all of this, but there must be a whole soup of, of different particle species in the local interstellar medium and also from the sun that you're, you're completely missing here in the picture. Can you talk more about that, please? Well, you're absolutely right with this point. So measurements of elemental and isotopic abundances of the local, local interstellar cloud gas are of fundamental importance. The local cloud is the sample of the present day galaxy to be compared with the protosolar cloud from which the solar system formed about 5 billion years ago. These observations are the key to understand, to understand uh, chemical evolution of galactic material. We simply do not know absolute densities of interstellar neutral species in the local cloud and in the heliosphere. We only have uh, estimates for about six, seven elements inferred from pickup ion measurements on Ulysses. So one of the important questions here for the interstellar probe is what is the composition of the local interstellar gas and how does it differ from that in the heliosphere? This is also the key to understand filtering and loss processes for interstellar neutrals at the heliosphere boundary and interstellar source of pick up ions in the heliosphere. Next slide, please. The second, so now let's move to the second objective. The second objective is to determine how the sun's activity, the interstellar medium, and its possible inhomogeneity influence the dynamics and evolution of the global heliosphere. The global interaction is highly dynamic and responds to changes in the solar wind dynamic pressure with the solar cycle. 
So IBEX high imaging of the heliosphere in, ENA, in uh, ENAs shows how those maps change brightness and structures during the solar cycle. As the interstellar probe will leave the heliosphere, it will image the heliosphere evolution under very different solar conditions that we observed previously and now, and over several solar cycles. Now, the flows in the heliosheath are highly dynamic with lots of variations. And um, in fact, Voyager 1 and 2 observed very different flow patterns along their trajectories through the heliosheath that we still uh, cannot understand with our best models that we have. Simulations that you see here on the right suggest very dynamic heliosheath with waves propagating and reflecting between the termination shock and heliopause and those boundaries oscillating in, a, in a, um, response to pressure pulses. So, however, it's not only the sun that controls the global heliosphere dynamics, but also the interstellar medium. So as the sun travels through the interstellar medium, there could be regions with different, uh, let's say, hydrogen densities and temperatures and ionization levels. And here on the bottom, you see simulations that show how different could be the heliosphere as it, en uh, as it enters these different regions. For example, the heliosphere in a dense neutral interstellar cloud would shrink and the heliopause would, the distance to the heliopause from the sun would be just 25 astronomical units. And compare this to Voyager observations uh, when heliopause was crossed by, uh, at about 120 astronomical units. Uh, or in another case, if the sun enters the tenuous hot plasma in the interstellar medium, the heliosphere will inflate and the distance to the heliopause would be about 300 astronomical units. So detailed measurements at the, at, the, uh, at the boundary and in the very local interstellar medium will help us to understand how heliosphere responds once the sun encounters the new environments in the interstellar medium. But, but Elena, I, I understand that the heliopause must be this very mysterious fuzzy boundary with instabilities going on. I, I get really compelled here, but, but the heliosphere should end with the heliopause, should it not? I mean, that's the definition of a heliopause. Well, fair question, Pontus. Next slide. So one of the great discoveries of voyagers is the shock waves in the very local interstellar medium that have very different nature than shocks that we observe in the heliosphere. We don't know the origin of those shocks, but they're certainly related with the disturbances launched by our sun, like coronal mass ejections, as you see on this movie. And those coronal mass ejections, they uh, travel all the way to the heliosphere boundary, they merge, they interact, and, and traverse through the heliosheath and travel beyond into the interstellar space. So the biggest question is how far these shocks in the interstellar medium can propagate, or in other words, how far the influence of our sun extends in the galaxy. Huh. Okay, so we don't really know at all what the extent of the heliosphere is. So suppose we get out beyond this sun sphere of influence and then there should be nothing than a constant medium, right? So, so why should we have to go all the way to 400 AU or even 1000 AU? It wouldn't it just be more of the same, more of the same, no? Well, the simple answer to your question is that we don't know. It's very much possible that there are variations in the local interstellar medium on scales of tens of astronomical units or hundreds of astronomical units. We don't know, we've never been there. So let me talk about the rich science that, uh, that is awaiting in the local interstellar medium. The third objective is uh, to discover and quantify directly the properties of the unexplored local interstellar medium. And properties such as neutral gas and plasma density and temperature and composition and dust properties and particle distributions, turbulence and magnetic field. The local interstellar medium is a completely new area for exploration and discovery, and we know very little about it. From line of sight spectra toward nearest stars, we have a global view on the interstellar medium and on the scales of light years. And recent studies suggest that the heliosphere is in contact with four interstellar clouds with different properties. And heliosphere, in fact, is, is approaching to the edge of the local interstellar cloud. Uh, with a relative, within relatively short galactic timescales, about a um, thousand years. But the ground truth of the properties of the very local interstellar medium is missing. We only have a sparse understanding inferred from measurements inside the heliosphere of uh, interstellar helium, pickup ions, and ENAs, 
and backscattered Lyman alpha emission. So the first step into this unexplored region of space would offer the first sampling of particles, fields, and dust, and any spatial variations that hold the key to understand the global heliospheric interaction, the interstellar cloud environment, the chemical evolution of the galaxy, and nuclear synthesis. So the interesting structure beyond the heliosphere that we never explored is so-called hydrogen wall with hotter and slower H atoms than in the pristine interstellar medium. The hydrogen wall was predicted by global models and was discovered as excessive absorption in Lyman alpha spectra toward stars. A similar absorption was seen for, from other astrospheres. So uh, that tells us that hydrogen wall that that is around our heliosphere. This is a generic astrospheric phenomenon, but we never observed it in situ. Observations of neutral uh, atom species and their temperature and velocity will discover its structure and properties and will help us to understand how hydrogen wall is formed around uh, other astrospheres. Also the interstellar dust. Uh, there is a disconnect between remote uh, sensing measurements of dust distribution and in situ dust sampling uh, by Ulysses. An interstellar probe with a dust analyzer will provide the ground truth by directly measuring the size distribution and elemental composition of the local interstellar dust. Also, interstellar probe opens unique opportunity for new cosmic ray science. The uh, part of the galactic cosmic ray spectrum below 1 GeV is uh, completely uh, unexplored. Uh, so galactic cosmic rays with energies above this, they don't care about the heliosphere, they just, they can be absorbed at Earth. But below 1 GeV, uh, uh, galactic cosmic rays are shielded by the heliosphere and uh, can only be studied once being outside the heliosphere, outside the heliopause. So measurements of elemental and isotopic abundances of the galactic cosmic rays will enable to distingu distinguish uh, the, the sources from various stellar and astrophysical objects and understand elemental fractionation and spallation in the interstellar medium. Of particular interest are measurements of the light elements like uh, lithium, beryllium, and boron, and their isotopes as these are important signatures of the origin and evolution of galactic cosmic rays. So uh, Pontus, so a mission like this would obviously fly through the outer solar system, but would it, re would it be really worth flying by another rock? New Horizons has already done that, and one more won't make much difference, right? Well, <laughs> that's exactly what I thought before New Horizons. Um, so, I mean, I'm a plasma, I'm a space plasma physicist, but just like New Horizons surprised us with a very active Pluto with aggressive ice mountains sort of floating in these oceans of amorphous CO2 ice and a very unexpected oblate binary MU69 or Arakoth as you see here. A flyby of another KBO and dwarf planet, I think about it, will bring these completely new discoveries and, and, and questions that uh, we didn't even know how to pose before, I think. Um, and, and there are over 4,000 KBOs out there and 130 dwarf planets. So the exploration of the solar system is still really in its infancy. I mean, we have barely begun to scratch, scratch the surface. So KBOs, uh, they, they have not altered much since, since they were created and therefore it's sort of a faucet record of the solar system formation. That's what makes them so compelling to fly by. Uh, dwarf planets, they teach us about the, the accretion and, and the dynamical evolution of the solar system. So one compelling target that has been picked as an example target in this study, uh, because we do need a, a direction, believe it or not, for the engineering study, that target is Quayar. Uh, with this moon Waywat. So that may, um, that dwarf planet uh, Quayar may be in its uh, very final stages of losing its volatile, volatile um, methane and may even have active cryovolcanism for all we know. The presence of its, uh, its little moon there that you see on your lower right makes it also an ideal sort of candidate for filling in this large gap in our understanding of collisional hi history and the formation of the solar system. The solar system is, um, is also surrounded by an enormous uh, dust disk, as Elena alluded to, which is uh, also tied to, to planetary formation. It's a remnant of when once the solar system was formed. Several other discoveries of dust disk uh, have been made, and you, you certainly probably have seen them already. Um, uh, and of course, there are around other stars. 
uh, like the one here to your right. They've been discovered mainly in the infrared. Um, and this one, HL Towery, is a circumsolar dust disk. Our circumsolar dust disk is fairly old. Um, but the one you see here, you can see, um, you see the rings. You see also asymmetric asymmetries here. And that's an evidence of planetary formation. And then you look at the age of the darn system and it's less than a million years old. So we got to take the textbooks and basically trash them. So our circumsolar dust, as I said, is, is about 4.6 billion years old. And, and therefore that would provide that only ground truth we have of a well-evolved solar system. However, it's, it's nearly impossible to image our own dust disk in infrared from the inside because its foreground emission would simply obscure this sort of global large-scale structure. Uh, so just by, by the trajectory, an interstellar probe would provide then this very unique platform from which we could then perform these IR observations on the way out, then even also from the outside to, to provide that first glimpse of, of the disk. Let me continue with dust here, because dust is, is certainly an interesting sort of cross-disciplinary subject that straddles over to astrophysics. So, so beyond the heliopause, uh, an interstellar probe would, would be able to directly sample the, the interstellar dust grains. And they're largely produced in, in supernova, supernovas and also condensed from, from stellar blow, blow off. Uh, very few of these, 43 on my latest count, if I got it correctly, have been detected inside the heliosphere. Uh, since, since simply these grains are charged uh, and thus they deflect at the, at the magnetic boundary of the heliosphere. Knowing their composition and, and the size distribution would also help us understand the, even the chemical evolution of the galaxy. Since a lot of all of these heavy ions heavy elements that are associated with stellar formation and evolution are believed to be locked, locked up inside of these dust grains. And lastly, the direct access to, to isotopic composition of neutrals and plasma, as we were alluding to in the beginning, um, would uh, even put uh, very important strong constraints on, on nucleosynthesis and, and, and cosmology, of course. Um, so speaking of infrared observations, Elena, could you tell us more about how these same infrared observations could open up the windows of even early galaxy formation? Oh, absolutely. So astrophysics had, uh, has long recognized the value of traveling into the very local interstellar medium. And this is the measurements of the extra galactic background light. So this is the light, uh, the diffuse redshifted light emitted by all stars and galaxies from uh, early after Big Bang and therefore contains all the light that ever shone. So once beyond the obscuring dust disk, and even at tens of astronomical units from the sun, the infrared uh, emission of, the, of this light would become de detectable and would provide information on the energy release and galaxy formation of the early universe. Well, we can talk about this outstanding science for the whole hour. So how about now we discuss the operation scenarios and example payloads? You're, you're absolutely right. This, this is like a whole, you know, candy store, candy mine for, for scientists here. Uh, and obviously part of our challenge here has been to sort of distill down all of this science into something that can feed into to the mission architecture. So having said that, without a solid plan for execution, th this would remain a dream or even a hallucination perhaps. But um, the nature of this study is, is a trade analysis, um, as you've heard many times. So to define this a useful and relevant trade space. We, we have um, two uh, different mission architectures or orthogonal mission architectures even. So on the, on the upper panel here, we have a baseline and the lower panel, it's an augmented scenario. Both assume a launch on an SLS block two that you will hear much more about later this season. Uh, and that would put us after a mere seven months from, from launch at Jupiter uh, for a Jupiter gravity assist that would slingshot the probe to more than twice the speed of Voyager 1, which is currently the fastest escaping spacecraft. And that would then reach the termination shock in just under 12 years. Um, the baseline here is completely driven by the heliophysics primary goal, goal number one. And shortly after launch, the, the spacecraft would uh, spin up and deploy booms and antennas and uh, measurements would start already um, in the inner heliosphere uh, to understand 
uh, even the boundary out there. And that's to understand the formation of the pickup ions that are later become so critical in this force balance um, in, in the boundary. Uh, imaging makes use of uh, the changing vantage point on this outward trajectory uh, to get a handhold already then on the 3D structure uh, before exiting the heliosphere. And uh, once reaching the boundary, the dedicated payload would then spend about um, four or five years uh, traversing the helio sheet and eventually uh, the heliopause to understand this new regime of, of space physics and all the instabilities out there. Once beyond the heliopause, uh, the interstellar phase would begin to explore then for the very first time the, the existence of a bow shock or if it's a bow wave or if it exists at all, um, the hydrogen wall, the extent of the heliospheric perturbations, and, and take that first image of, of, of our habitable bubble from the outside. And then interstellar probe would set out on this unknown ocean of the interstellar medium itself, filled with you know, clues of, of even the evolution of the galaxy. Uh, the augmented scenario uh, satisfies also the desire for a KBO flyby and the astrophysics observations. So he here we are looking at a three axis controlled spacecraft using thrusters. Um, much like New Horizons, this would enable us to have a, both a spinning mode to satisfy the plasma physics observations or measurements in the heliosphere and the boundary. And then it would transition into a three axis mode uh, during the tracking of the KBO itself. So to make sure that all of this science is captured into a pragmatic mission design, we, we have finalized a, a pretty large science traceability matrix for, for each of the two scenarios. Uh, of course, this is an extremely condensed version. Uh, all of these versions, they, they can be found on our website very shortly. So uh, starting from the left are the goals and objectives that we talked about through uh, detailed measurement objectives. Uh, and then here abbreviated measurement requirements. And then lastly, to mission requirements on the very right, on distance, on time and, and trajectory and so on and so forth. So what this has allowed us to do is allowed us to define a baseline requirements to which the mission shall be designed in this example. Um, and also it has allowed us to uh, define mission success criteria. And in a mission like this, um, uh, that reflects multiple different set of, sets of measurements that each define a, a mission success. Let's go over to uh, the example payload. Um, our job here is, uh, is to conduct, of course, a trade study of, of the different mission architectures. So to do that, we, we have to construct a realistic example payload that will then feed in and drive the engineering requirements. Um, and let me emphasize this again. What is exactly going to fly in the future is not our job. That's the job of a future science definition team that NASA would, uh, would establish. The baseline example payload uh, focuses, of course, on heliophysics only. As I said already, uh, here the spacecraft would be a sun-pointed spinner. The mission design is uh, larger driven by the need of carry long wire antennas, plasma wave antennas, to measure plasma waves, and those are centrifugally deployed. We have been adamant from day one on keeping a fixed mass allocation. Uh, this is to both better reflect the, the necessary trade-offs in a real mission uh, so that we can serve this sort of science definition team better to give them realistic examples of trades and, and, and hard decisions. And also to eventually um, control uh, the cost of, of a historic mission like this. Um, it, it, so our... Our guiding principle in, in doing all of these uh, trades has been that the in situ measurements on a probe like this remains a priority, but with a balanced complement of uh, powerful remote imaging. So we're now in the very final stages of documenting these trades uh, in detail uh, for the final report, and uh, you will see those uh, much more in detail later. Okay, so here's the, the, the portion of the science traceability matrix of the augmented scenario. I'm only show, showing the supporting goal two and goal three here, the planetary and astrophysics goal here. Uh, uh, a couple of balanced trade-offs have been made to the primary goal, but uh, all in all, it retains almost all of its original objectives under the primary goal. 
Two instruments are able to address the science of the KBO flybys, uh, the distance observations, uh, the circumsolar dust disk, uh, to uh, also the extragalactic background light. And this, I think, has been accomplished really by uh, this sort of good uh, guiding insight from, from how the small payload on New Horizons was, was really operated. So the augmented model payload, uh, there are two unique, unique instruments on the very bottom here. Uh, and those are the uh, visible near infrared camera and also the visible uh, IR mapper uh, for of course, KBO science and astrophysics. And a balance trade has been made with the Lyman Alpha to accommodate for those two in, in, within this fixed uh, mass allocation. Uh, being driven by the KBO flyby, uh, this scenario, of course, relies on three-axis thrust synchronous spacecraft. Um, much again, much like New Horizons, uh, this enables us to go from in the inner heliosphere, uh, go from uh, spin stabilized to three axes during the flyby, and then back to spin stabilized after the flyby. Obviously, this also necessitates that the, the, the plasma wave antennas uh, need to be shorter and rigid. Uh, an option has been discussed to deploy the 50 meter wire antennas after completed flybys. Uh, this has been analyzed from a mission risk perspective and that mission risk is, is high. And we are documenting that in detail. Um, Elena, have I forgotten anything? Pontus, you haven't shown this spacecraft yet. Oh, right. Ha, there's a spacecraft. So here's the first rendering and a snapshot of sort of where we are in the design. Uh, uh, several details are still being discussed and laid out. A lot of you can see that this design is, uh, looks like Voyager. And of course that's not, not a coincidence. The layout is driven by this large high gain antenna, five meter uh, in this case. And you can see particle instrumentation on, on these rigid pedestals to avoid the obscuration of, of the antenna dish because the, we really want for the particle instrumentation to have this four pi field of view. Two next uh, generation RTGs, they allow for continuous operations of all instruments uh, within the normal design lifetime. <clears throat> and the communications uh, is system is, is plain expand communication to provide the required data rates to, to get all the data down. And as you can see, uh, there are no solar sails. There are no flying fishing reactors. There's no fusion drives nor warp drives. It's just a modern, reliable spacecraft that can be built today. So it's been a pretty long road with this large team, I think, but it's only the beginning, as you know. It's really rewarding, I think, to for everyone to see how this has grown from to, um, from a really to a realistic concept that that actually can fly, um, but of course the the ultimate reward I think is for all and for heliophysics is when this mission is launched and and begins uh, it, its journey. So to wrap up here, and this is usually the point where I get a little bit philosophical. I I, I often have to take we often have to take a few steps back to remind ourselves that this is. This is not an ordinary mission. Mission. This is not, you know, business as usual. Uh, Interstellar probe is the beginning of humanity's journey into the galaxy, and as our exploration pushes outward, uh, the boundaries of heliophysics and even space science inevitably also expand to with it, which is what makes this mission so compelling to many of us. Um, and, and out there, the, these preconceived. Uh, boundaries of disciplines and divisions. They naturally blur together as we make all of these new discoveries. So as NASA's next uh, heliophysics uh, large strategic mission, I believe we are technically ready to take this first explicit step on a long journey to understand our home in the galaxy. Uh, and, and this and next year will be critical for propelling this mission concept and the science mission foremost into rank order one of the solar and space physics at the Kela survey. And we invite all of your enthusiasm and engagement to actually get there. And, and I know, Elena, you have been uh, very active in this area in terms of white papers and, and other things. Yes, thank you, Pontus. I'm, I'm extremely excited and enthusiastic about this mission. So let me be a bit uh, more pragmatic here and talk about our future plans. So in, in preparation with, uh, to the Helio 2050 workshop, uh, which is happening on, on the first week of May, 
uh, we have submitted uh, 15 white papers related to science, engineering, and programmatics of the interstellar, uh, interstellar probe mission. So please participate in the Audi Helio session on May 5th. Um, we're also working on about uh, 30 white papers, I think, uh, as of today, planned for the decadal, and we are coordinating our efforts, and we will put those white, pa white paper proposals online, so please support them. Uh, and as always, please check our website and uh, there will be future webinars. We also plan the fourth interstellar probe exploration workshop this fall and the AGU session on the interstellar probe mission. So join our journey. And um, with that, welcome to season two and let's begin. Thank you very much, Pontus and Elena. And now we're gonna have our question and answer session. Pontus, you mind going to the next slide? Thank you. Our first question is from Tom Kremegis. I couldn't tell if, pickup, if the pickup ion instrument will be able to determine charge state. Models assume that ions are, are singly charged in the helio sheath. Sorry, it keeps jumping around, but no one knows for sure. Can, can you comment on this? Yes, indeed, the pickup ion instrument that we have in mind will be able to do uh, charge states. That's, that's the simple answer. And, and yes, you're right. The charge states of, for example, O6 plus and O7 plus from the sun are, are sort of tracers of, of what belongs to the solar wind and what does not. Thank you, Pontus. And the next question is from Chuck Quintero. Is Sedna also on the study list as a potential target? Elena, you want to take that one? Well, I would rather ask you to answer that question. Okay, I'll, I'll take it. That's fine. So uh, I think the, the fair answer is, uh, is yes. And I come back to uh, the, the, that we're a trade study. We have, I believe, six directions that we have uh, looked at with, with the teams. They all have their pros and cons. Uh, and we, uh, we, we had it, we've carried a table in the last two workshops of, of those trades, but you'll certainly see that in, uh, in the final report as well. And here we have uh, help from Kirby, who is a planetary lead uh, for planetary science in the interstellar probe. And he says that the future science definition team could baseline Sedna. Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions right now, so please feel free to submit questions. While we wait, Pontus or Elena, are there any final remarks that you'd like, like to say? No other than um, the criticality of these next two years. This, this, is, this is very important that, you know, now we've gone through the study. So I see the next phase for us, which we've already begun, is, is to take all of this science and make sure that we, we, we disseminate it um, in, in peer-reviewed articles. Uh, Elena was mentioning in the book, we're soon submitting a book proposal as well, which will be the first interstellar probe, uh, well, which will be the interstellar probe uh, book where we capture all of the science traits, the overview of the engineering and the mission architecture, and so on and so forth. Thank you, Pontus. And we actually just got several more questions now. Um, if the, actually, two of them address the same topic. Um, are, are, the, are there any instruments uh, for studying dusty plasma or in situ uh, dusty plasma? I can maybe start with this question and maybe Pontus can add later. So we, as Pontus showed in the uh, baseline payload and augmented payload, there, there is a um, dust analyzer instrument uh, that will focus on uh, measurements of dust, the, uh, the size distribution, mass distribution, and how it changes from, as we go from inside the heliosphere to outside. And that, that uh, concerns a lot of uh, fundamental questions about dust, uh, which is a very unexplored, uh, sort of part of this uh, global interaction problem. So Pontus, is there anything you would like to add? Well, no, I think that was pretty complete. The, uh, the other thing that uh, is tied into the dust science is of course, you, you got to span all of these very different sizes and masses of dust. 
Um, so, and you can do that uh, by also relying on the neutral mass spec. Uh, they can go after the, uh, the, the smaller dust and then the uh, interstellar dust analyzer will cover the, the, most of the range. And then on top of that, um, if you remember the student dust counter on board New Horizons, that, that was simply uh, measuring dust hits of large dust grains. And number four, uh, plasma wave antennas, they do also measure dust hits as well. So that's fairly important that we bring all, all of that uh, entire size range um, uh, into play here. Thank you, Pontus and Elena. And the next question is, does the mission still require a close flyby of the sun for a gravity boost? I can take that one. Uh, the baseline we have now does not. Uh, so as I, as I said here during the operation scenario slide, maybe it was too, too fast, but uh, this is a direct inject to Jupiter. And at Jupiter, you could either do a powered gravity assist uh, with a star 48 a kick booster, uh, or you could burn everything at Earth uh, and then do a passive Jupiter gravity assist. Both of those take you up to uh, about 7.6 AU per year and, and maybe even more. Uh, we, we are looking at a solar O-birth maneuver, uh, and for those of you who don't know, the solar O-birth maneuver uh, was invented, or discovered really, by Herman O-birth back in 1929. Uh, and basically what you do is you go out to Jupiter and you do a uh, retrograde Jupiter gravity assist to slow down your angular momentum around the sun, such that you you've basically let the spacecraft fall into the sun and just barely miss it. And when you're at the deepest uh, point in the gravity well, you fire everything. And we're talking about firing that in, in 90 seconds. Um, so it's a very large thrust. The big problem out there is of course, is uh, that the sun is hot. You need to make a difference. You need to go below four RS here. Um, and that heat shield is heavy. Uh, on Parker Solar Probe, we have a carbon on carbon approach that won't work below 4, 4 RS. So you have to go to uh, stronger and, and, uh, and, and have your materials such as tungsten, rhenium. So you can imagine, we're talking about a, tons of, of a heat shield here. And, and I can go on about the technical details uh, that will make this a very, very a little bit risky maneuver. Michael, please. Yes, you bet. Um, I'm Michael Paul. I'm the uh, project manager for the study. And yes, we are still looking at um, how to perform a solar orbit maneuver. We've done some really interesting research with, a, with an outside company on uh, augmenting the ability of heat shields while reducing their mass at the same time. And over the next few months and included in our final report, which will come out uh, at the end of this calendar year, we're going to have the results of that research to show just what the mass cost and even the, the financial cost of such a shield would be and what the impact would be on our outbound speed. And one of the most important things that we're trying to categorize here is would more speed get us better science? And it's not clear that another 10 or 20 or 30% of outbound speed is gonna make the science for this mission better. It might make the mission faster by a little bit, um, but it's not going to make it five or 10 times faster. And that's very clear to us at this point, because with the excess um, speed comes the cost of excess mass, which reduces overall speed in the end. So, um, so stay tuned for more of that. The research has been very illuminating in so many ways. Uh, and we've really dug into it to be able to provide the data that shows what the actual impact is. Thank you very much, Michael and Pontus. And the next question is from Eric Posner. Is there an engineering slash instrumentation approach to adjust for charging plasma inflow directions? I, I think that was for to adjust for changing plasma inflow directions, correct? Yes, my apologies. Yeah. Yes, I'm not sure if I understand Eric's questions, but, but uh, this is a spinning platform and there will be a four pi coverage of, of, of the plasma sensors, of course. So it's, that will take into account um, any flow direction. If I misunderstood your question, Eric, I mean, please elaborate on it. Thank you, Pontus. And the next question is from Megan Seaver. Can you say again how long you anticipate the spacecraft will take to get to the heliosphere boundary? 
Alina, can you take this one? Absolutely. Thank you, James. Yeah, so Interstellar Pro will travel with a speed as, as at least as twice as, as uh, Voyager 1 speed, and it will get to the heliosphere boundary in around 15 years. And compare this to Voyagers. It took uh, 35 years for Voyagers to get to the, to cross the heliosphere boundary and enter the interstellar space. Thank you, Elena. And the next question is from Jim Spann. Is there any advantage to considering the NASA SLS for this mission? Pontus, do you want to take this one? Or uh, Michael? Michael haven't spoken enough. Michael, please. <laughs> um, uh, Jim, the answer is, is absolutely. In fact, we consider SLS to be enabling for this mission. There are no other launch vehicles that appear to be available uh, in the decade that the next space and solar physics decadal covers that will allow us to double the speed of a Voyager mission with a spacecraft of moderate size, which allows us to make it an affordable mission for, for the science mission directorate. Um, and, uh, and so we, we, um, we, we have baselined SLS. SLS is enabling for this mission. We are working on getting enough information to understand what other options might provide in terms of total outbound speed and what the impact would be on the mission. Um, but at this point, it looks like uh, we, we really need SLS to make this mission a reality and have been very pleased, very, very pleased with the cooperation and collaboration from the SLS team. Thank you very much, Michael. And the next question is from Zubair Shaikh. As it is mentioned, spacecraft measure, measures plasma properties. Does data include temperature component, which can be used to study temperature and isotropy in the heliosheath region? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that, that's the idea behind the instrumentation. And, and remember, the instrumentation that we have on here, uh, no instrumentation uh, in that heritage is, is exactly designed for an interstellar probe. Will it do the job? Yes. Uh, but the instrumentation we have in the heritage uh, will certainly go down to, to far enough uh, energies so we can measure temperatures uh, and uh, in terms of just measure temperature as well uh, for the plasma wave antennas, that's the importance of having 50 meter wire, uh, 50 meter thin wires, such that you can use the, the quasi-thermal noise analysis to get to the temperature as well. Thank you, Pontus. And I believe now we have clarification from Eric Posner, and he says backward inflow before and forward inflow after passing the heliopause. Can you comment on that, Pontus? Yeah, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, but, but again, there is a four pi coverage of the, of the plasma, uh, of the plasma sensor, so it, it would cover it. But we can certainly discuss this offline. Thank you, Pontus. And the next question is uh, whether the probe will have any uh, radiation shield. Michael, would you like to take this one? Yeah, we, we've gotten uh, a lot of good information on what it's going to take to protect it from radiation over the course of the entire mission, as well as at the intense period of the flyby of Jupiter. And of course, we'll make sure that the, uh, that the electronics and the instrumentation and so forth have appropriate shielding. Um, uh, radiation from the sun, it's really going to be just the, the total um, spectrum of heat coming in that we have to deal with if we do the solar orbit maneuver. Thank you, Michael. And for our last question of today, uh, Mike Rutman asks, what are the pointing requirements for communications near the end of the mission? Uh, uh, the um, long story short on that is they're very tight and the um, higher frequency communications that we go to, the tighter they get. We have an entire library of um, reports, papers, and presentations on engineering aspects of the project that you can find on our website, interstellarprobe.jhuapl.edu. And at the November workshop, there's uh, at least two, if not three presentations on the communications aspect of this, if you'd like more details. Thank you very much, Michael. And Pontus, could you go to the next slide, please? Hang on. Yep, there we go. All right. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much to our panelists and thank you for attending today's webinar. Please visit the Interstellar Probe Study website for more information about the study and to view information on future webinars and events. Also, please consider signing up on our listserv under the Community Involvement section of the website 
to make sure you're getting the latest information on upcoming webinars and events. Thanks for joining us and have a wonderful day.